Hello and welcome to my Dungeon of Sorrow. Or something generic like that. And let me tell you a tale. In a time where vampires could go out in the daylight and sparkle in it, 30-year-olds played high schoolers instead of much older men of lore, and vampires sucked dick instead of blood. We bring you an era of darkness. This is all, of course, caused by one Stephanie Meyer, the author of the popular Twilight series, which not only treated women as dumbfounded meandering buffoons, but set them back about 50 years. Now, if you've heard of the series, you are fall into one of several categories. You either hate the series with a passion and wish it would die for sodomizing cinema, you love it blindly and will do anything to please your lord and savior Stephanie Meyer, or you find it hilarious and anything associated with it. In the midst of this vampire popularity, some really great things were created, such as Kamen Rider Kiba in Japan. But there was also a lot of interesting media that was not so good. One of the things to come out of this was a video game. Witches and Vampires, The Secrets of Ashbury for the DS. Okay, I'm not going to keep doing that voice. Anyways, Witches and Vampires, The Secrets of Ashbury was released for the DS on November 2nd, 2010. Wait, what? You released the game after Halloween? What kind of marketing was that? The demand for a game like this would have dwindled by then. What the hell? Well, I guess it makes sense. Most people had already been playing Red Dead Redemption Undead Nightmare the week before, not to mention games like Rock of the Dead and Castlevania Lords of Shadow which came out earlier in the month. So I guess releasing the game afterwards makes sense in that respect. So what was I doing around the time this was released? Well, going to Yomacon for the first time. Yeah, it's a con I seem to go every other year. Sadly, I can't go this year due to scheduling issues, but anyways, I'm getting sidetracked. The game was published by Crave Entertainment, who had released a plethora of games including Beyblade for the PS1, Blaster Master Blasting Again, Cartoon Network Punch Time Explosion, Fighting Force, Gex 3, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, Eternal Ring, and Evergrace. Crave focused on publishing lower budget and import games. Ironically, on Halloween of 2012, they filed for bankruptcy. This isn't looking like a good sign, is it? With all that being said, what were my expectations for Witches and Vampires? Honestly, I was expecting either a really bad survival horror game, or a high school horror simulator to cash in on series such as Monster High. So my expectations weren't very high. Also considering I only paid $10 for this game, and it came with a DSi case, yeah, I didn't have very high hopes for this. The game starts off with a narration about the quiet town of Ashbury. Here we meet Aluna Warren, a woman who left Ashbury three years ago to move to Babylon City to escape the secrets of her family. Which is why she decided to come back. We then meet her little sister, Ruby, the stereotypical goth teenager and ironically user of healing magic. Yeah. And her brother, Daryl, a vampire who specializes in offensive magic. They were called there by their mother, Valthura, to discuss something important, and from the conversation we can see why Aluna is not comfortable around her family. See, the Warren family is a family of magic users, a la the game's title, and Aluna just wants the stereotypical I want a normal life bullshit. This brings up a question that I've had about characters for a long time. Why do these type of characters exist? What do you mean you don't want magical powers? Who doesn't want magical powers? I want magical powers. The fact that you don't want your magical powers pisses me off because I want magical powers. You entitled little c okay. I should stop before I get into a rant. Back to the plot, Valthera called them here because she needs their magic to help use a moonstone to evolve her Nidorina into Nidoqueen before level 23 so it can learn Body Slam. Oh yeah, and just to add more to the Nintendo joke pot... Their conversation is cut short when they get transported to another dimension and are forced to fight... Oh! This is where the game's battle system kicks in, because the game is an RPG, a slow, but interesting take on the RPG formula. First off, there are no basic attack or defend commands, just spells. In order to use a spell, you must use the stylus to draw the symbol for the spell as best you can. The more accurate your drawing, the higher rate of success and damage dealt. I found this system interesting, but also a pain in the ass for a few reasons. You have to draw symbols for virtually everything except using items, attacking, defending, healing, and running from battle. Secondly, the success rate is weird. 
Sometimes I won't even be close to matching the symbol and the spell will still work, while other times I'll move slightly off course and the spell will fail. I like that they're using the DS's capabilities in the combat system, but it needs to be refined. As for using items, you can only use them on the character whose turn it is, so you cannot use healing items on other party members, which pretty much destroys the point of using items since healing magic can be used on any party member when cast. Not to mention, battles just run at a snail's pace. The footage here is running at 60 frames per second, which is not the normal frame rate for the game. Thus, the playback is making it seem faster than it actually is. I had to record this with an emulator, and it will only record gameplay at 60 frames. And trust me, the emulator lags so bad on my computer that during recording, it sometimes got five times slower than what you're seeing here. After defeating the ghost, it casts a spell on Valthura. When they return to the house, Valthura says, A bad on before going unconscious. Their only lead is Jasper Legal, the man who had been narrating this whole time, and an old friend of Valthura's. They set off to find him, and from here you can now explore the town. You can do side quests or enter random battles when transferring between areas to increase your experience and skill points. Leveling up works differently in this game compared to other RPGs. In order to increase your stats and learn new skills, you must go upstairs in the Warren Manor and choose them at the desk. This is the only way to distribute your points and upgrades. It's like if you're playing Final Fantasy Tactics, but limiting the job management to only being accessible Garland Magic City. I like that I get to choose my character's growth, but this system is not a very good one. Sure, people rag on the junctioning from Final Fantasy VIII and the sphere grid from Final Fantasy X, but at least you can adjust those any time outside of battle or cutscenes. Here, you're stuck going back every time you want to up your stats, basically forcing you to either wait till you have to go back to the house for a plot point, or just entering and leaving the house over and over again to initiate random battles in that one spot, just so you can be close to the house to upgrade your stats. Yay! You can also make potions in the house with Ruby or do combat training in the basement. Making potions is actually really interesting. It uses the stylus to add ingredients and mix them, and you can blow on the DS microphone to cool it down. The only thing I may advise is saving before making any potions, because if you fuck up, you don't get your ingredients back. The combat training is just casting spells against dummies, nothing special here. Later on in the game, you'll get to take part in a treasure hunting minigame where you have a time limit traveling around a dungeon looking for items and dirt clots. You then can use the stylus as a scratch lottery ticket to reveal items or other things in the clots of dirt. Eventually you'll find Jasper in a graveyard where he has discovered the crypt of One-Eyed Jack, one of the six pirate founders of Ashbury. The pirates were known as Wreckers because they would use lighthouses in the town to fool ships into crashing, then would loot the crash site for treasure. Here you'll get your first boss fight with the ghost of One-Eyed Jack, and and all his annoying ass spells. <laughs> I hope you have burn heal. After defeating Jack, the battle is not over. You'll have to destroy the pillars by using magic that matches their elements, so fire and ice. Once the battle is over, Jasper discovers the memoirs of One-Eyed Jack. It explains the only way to remove the curse on the town is to collect the six amulets. The moonstone being one of them means there are five more to collect. Here's where my explanation of the story will end. From here, the plot is pretty straightforward. Collect the MacGuffins to save the world, blah blah blah. Not the most innovative story, but considering the presentation so far, it's acceptable. The graphics for a DS game are actually pretty good. It has an early PlayStation feel to it, which is both good and bad. The good is that it's impressive on the DS, where it's able to render polygons clearly. The bad is that it's already dated technology and other games including ports of N64 titles have shown that the DS can do better. Also, the refresh rate on the background is weird. It has a very Super FX chip feel to its scaling, where it feels like it's loading a room position and locking it into frame. It's hard to explain, but imagine Star Fox whenever something is in motion. It's not actually traveling on a polygonal plane, it's sprites that are locked down for each form of motion. Again, it's hard to explain, but play a little of this, then play a full 3D PlayStation game, and you'll feel the difference. However, the battle effects are pretty good, my favorite one being the animation for the group heal spell. Sound-wise, the game is lacking. The music is generic, the sound effects are dull, and the voice acting is hilarious, if you can even call that voice acting. It's actually more like voice cues you hear every now and then, just basic things like hey. or not really necessary for this kind of game, but probably my favorite is when you use a physical attack with Dario. Yeah. I'll never get tired of hearing that. All in all, what can I say about Witches and Vampires? It's not very good. I got about as far as Chapter 4 before I gave up out of boredom. The combat, while innovative, is boring and slow. The plot is about as generic as you can get. The characters are bland and don't do much to step out of their stereotypical nature. The graphics are decent but dated, and the sound is weak and uninspired. Strangely enough, this game got a sequel. Witches and Vampires, The Ghost Pirates of Ashbury, released April 29th, 2010, exclusively to Europe. Wait a minute. You released a sequel first? What did, could, what, cause, could, what kind of sense does that make? Considering that Secrets of Ashbury was released over six months later, I can assume the game is about the same for the most part. Ironically, as I was researching for this review, another review was written on the GameStop page for this game by one of the top 25 contributors, and despite this person's review being more harsh on the game, he gave it a fairly high score. 
So the real question is, can I recommend Witches and Vampires The Secrets of Ashbury for the DS? Well, the short answer is no, I can't. Um, the reasons are, while I got enjoyment out of the game and I felt a sense of accomplishment, this game takes a lot of patience and it doesn't ever pay off. There are plenty of other RPGs out there in the same type of vein as this that you could be playing, and they do a much better job at it. Now, that's all I can say about this game. But tune in for part two, when I'm going to take a look at a game that I've been requested to review for a few years now. I'm Zero, and I'll see you in part two. <laughs>